Good morning. Good to see you this morning. Welcome to those who are watching on the live stream. Thanks for tuning in wherever you're watching from. So uh, just a, a quick recap from last week. See, uh, we were, a few of us were in Nebraska last Sunday. And, and um, if you didn't see the message, yes, yeah, somebody said burr. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of cold in Nebraska. Why were we there is that we were there to learn. We were there to be at another church. Uh, there were five of us that went here from Foothills and we were there uh, just to be with their team and their staff, their Sunday morning. And uh, because we're committed to learning and we're committed to wanting to be the best leaders that we can be for the kingdom of God and for you and what God has called us to be here in our own geographic area. And so it is just absolutely essential for us to just always maintain the posture of learning for the rest of our lives. I expect that out of you. And, and so it would be kind of silly for me not, not to model that. I'm still learning. I've been in ministry my entire adult life. I'm still learning. I'm still growing and learning from others. And so uh, that's what we were doing. Had a great time. Enjoyed some uh, Midwest hospitality. But uh, yeah, Nebraska. Glad we got out before all that snow showed up. Holy smokes. Yes. Good to be home. So... All right, I want to start off this morning just by telling a little bit of a story uh, back a very long time ago when I was in high school. So I think it was somewhere around my junior year in high school. Uh, there was a, a, my current youth pastor at the time, he was working with a few of us, training us to share our faith and uh, given us opportunities to do that. So, you know, we had some class time, we practiced. And, and then what he and a few other leaders did was we began to go out on what's called visitation. What's visitation? Sounds ominous, doesn't it? If somebody showed up in the church that had a teen, a junior high or high schooler, then adults would go out and visit them, visit the family, uh, take one of us along, you know, and we could... Uh, you know, practice sharing our faith if the opportunity showed up. Okay, so that's what was going on. So on this particular night, I was paired up with my youth pastor at that time, and we were developing uh, quite a mentoring relationship back then. That's actually continuing to this day, but that's another story. So we showed up at this person's house. They had attended the church, uh, you know, that week or uh, several weeks. There was a high school student there. I didn't know the student, didn't know the name or anything. So we knocked on the door. The student answers the phone, oh, the phone. The door opens it up and instantly looks at me and says, I know you. I'm like, oh boy, what do you know, okay? Um, got me a little nervous right from the start. We came in. I, back in that day, I mean, I was a jock. I was an athlete. So you probably knew who I was just watching a game, okay? But still, it did make me a little, it was unnerving. We went in, we started talking, small talk, talking about life, talking about what he'd like to do, just all the normal stuff. And my youth pastor, he was a master at taking any conversation and eventually turning it towards a spiritual conversation. And this is kind of what we were learning how to do. But he was so good at it. So before long, all of a sudden, we were talking about God. And it didn't feel weird. He just did it really naturally. And so now we're talking about God and, and about our relationship with God. And this student pretty much just didn't know anything about it. And, and he's talking about, well, you know, it's a, it's a personal relationship. Would you like to know more about that? And I'm just sitting here watching the master at work, right? And the, and the student said, yeah, I'd like to know more. And then my youth pastor says, well, Dale will explain it to you. Ah, <laughs> uh, what? You're the professional? I didn't say that, but inside, I mean, I'm panic stricken. I'm like, oh my gosh. He, of course, he just looks at me and smirks, all right? And so I, you know, stutter my way through, talking, trying to explain that, yeah, it's a relationship and it's Jesus and and. It got to a place where my youth pastor says, do you want to give your life to Jesus? Do you want to pray and receive Jesus? And the student said, yes, I would. And I sat there inside thinking, you're kidding me. Really? I mean, this actually happens. And we prayed and the student gave their life to Jesus that night. And I don't know whose life changed more, his or mine. Something changed in me that night. Something began in me that night. I think for the first time there was a realization 
that I was part, my faith was part of something bigger. I was part of what God was doing and I actually joined it that night. There, there was a spiritual agenda that, that God just used me to do something in it. It was, it was, it was life altering. It was my first time, I believe, I, I tasted, he talks about the kingdom of God. I tasted the kingdom of God that night and it changed, and it changed me. I, I think it's, well, Jesus says this in Matthew 6, Let's look at it. He says, seek the kingdom of God. Seek it. Above all else. So it's kind of a big deal. Live righteously. He'll give you everything you need. This verse gives us a life priority and then a, a promise that goes with it. If we make God's kingdom our top life pursuit and live righteously. He says, I'll, I'll take care of you. I'll give you everything you need. But what does that look like in real life. How do we seek the kingdom of God? I mean, at the time, I, I'm already attending church. I'm already going to youth group. I already believe in Jesus. I mean, come on, I'm killing it, aren't I? Well, there's more. There's more. It's a great start. But there's more. I might be where some of you are at. It's a great start. There's more. Today, we are going to explore building our lives with kingdom work. This whole series has, has been about how do we align our lives in a way that God will bless? But what does it look like to follow Jesus? And we've been talking about that week after week. And, and so today we're going we're gonna to continue it by, by talking about building your life now with kingdom work. This is, this is where we get the word serving, right? It's, it's the same thing. But it's, it's far more than just volunteering. We're going to see that serving God's kingdom it is a way that we can practically seek the kingdom of God. That's the command. Seek the kingdom of God. Okay, I, I, I've got I've to be involved in the kingdom then in some way. Seeking God's kingdom is more than a desire. It, there is a responsibility that goes with it. And today we are going to talk about part of what that responsibility looks like. And that is again, building your life with kingdom work. So those four things I want to share. Here we go. Number one. Number one, kingdom work is dedicated to the kingdom of God. It's not our kingdom. It's God's kingdom. Look, 1 Corinthians 4.20, for the kingdom of God is not just a lot of talk. And there is a lot of talk about the kingdom of God out there. Sometimes too much talk. It's not a lot of talk. It's living by God's power. Wow. This verse tells us that God's kingdom is right now. It's not someday. Well, I thought God's kingdom is in heaven someday. Yes, there's future, there's now. God's kingdom is right now. God's kingdom is in us. Do you realize God's kingdom is in you because Jesus is in you if you're a follower of Jesus. The power of God's kingdom resides in each one of us. God's kingdom is not just talk. It is learning to live by God's power. God's kingdom power is for his kingdom work. Do you realize that? You will see kingdom power, then you align your life to his kingdom. The reason we do not see more power of God in this world is because we have a church. With not, I'm talking big church, okay, not foothills. Because people are not willing to align their life to God. God's power is not for your thing or my thing. His power is for his thing. And when we align our lives in a way that we're, where we're living in sync with him, that's what the power of God's for. His kingdom, not my kingdom. So, oh, a couple things about this. First of all, we need to understand that when we give our lives to Jesus, we've changed kingdoms. We belong to another kingdom. Philippians 3.20 says, For we are citizens of heaven where the Lord Jesus Christ lives. Citizens of heaven. Let that sink in. And we are eagerly awaiting for him to return as our Savior. We must have a kingdom mindset if we're going to seek the kingdom of God. What this means is, is we are keenly aware that we belong to another kingdom. We are citizens of heaven. When you give your life to Jesus, there's a kingdom transfer that, cha that takes place, a kingdom change. The Bible says, I used to belong to the kingdom of darkness. Now I belong to the kingdom of light. That you've changed kingdoms. This is our temporary assignment. Our temporary country that we live in. We, we don't belong to this country. You know, if you've never traveled internationally, there is a feeling that you get when you leave the country. 
And there's also a cool feeling when you come back, you know? I just, every time we come back into the U.S., okay, my wife gets so sick of it. We'll come walking off the airplane. We get back into America, uh, back into the U.S. I'm like, born in the U.S. Okay, so we just <laughs> like coming home. Because when you're in another country, and we've had the privilege of being in so many different countries. We love to travel, travel quite extensively in Central America. But then you get farther away. You get into Europe. I mean, we've been places, you know, we've been to Italy. And we've been to, we've been to Greece. Uh, we've been, you want you want to really feel that you're in a different country? We've been in Turkey. We've been in Jordan. We flew into the Dubai airport once. Dubai. Hun, we are not in Malala anymore, okay? <laughs> Woo, different place. We are foreigners in this world. We will live according to the kingdom we identify most with. So many believers would say this. They would say, uh, I'm an American who is a follower of Jesus. You see, what's wrong with that? The result is they would then behave in this way. The identity is being an American first. But for those who belong to another kingdom, we say, well, I'm a follower of Jesus who happens to live in the U.S., I'm a follower of Jesus who happens to be an American. The identity is in our spiritual and eternal kingdom first, our physical country second, our true loyalty is to God's kingdom first, and the earthly kingdom second. Why is this such a big deal? Because the kingdom you identify with first will be the one that has the most influence on your life. That's what has the most influence on your life. It determines your identity, it influences your thinking, it modifies your behavior, it alters your values, it alters your priorities that you live for. It makes it, it, makes it clear where your loyalties really lie. Now listen, uh, don't think I'm not patriotic. I love being born in the US. I believe anybody who was born in the United States, you won the geographic lottery of the world, okay? With all of its issues, it's still the greatest place to live on earth, I believe. But our loyalty as far as of Jesus is to the kingdom of God first. As citizens of another kingdom, we do work in and for this kingdom. And kingdom work advances God's kingdom. It advances the kingdom of God. We need to understand there's a kingdom agenda for planet earth. That might be new to you. There's a kingdom agenda for planet earth. God has an agenda for planet earth. And that you and I are a part of. God did more than save us out of this broken, sinful world. He employs us to serve his purposes. He employs us to serve his kingdom agenda. The kingdom work he involves us in represents his kingdom. Not our kingdom. Not our country. It represents his kingdom. It teaches the values of his kingdom. It influences others for his kingdom. It explains the truth of his kingdom. It elevates the person of the kingdom, which is Jesus. The issues have never been a lack of kingdom opportunities in this world. The issue has always been a lack of workers in the kingdom. It's always been the issue. Over the years, I've had so many conversations with spiritual leaders, other Christians, even pastors. And I have heard this for 25 years, and I completely reject it. That whole oh, pastor, it's so hard to reach people in, in the Malala area. I, well, I, mean, I want to make this really clear. I reject that as a lie from the pit. It is not true because Jesus said it's not true. Well, why do I get so worked up about this? Because what Jesus said. Let's look what he said, Luke 10. These were his instructions to them, to his disciples, and to us as he looks at the, the, the mass of people that were in front of Jesus. The harvest is great. The workers are few. That's the problem. That's the problem. So pray to the Lord who's in charge of the harvest. Ask him to send more workers into the fields. Ask God to awaken people to their job, to their responsibility. That come on, the, the, the harvest is ripe. People may reject going to church, but they do not reject spiritual things in this world today. The problem's always been a labor shortage, not opportunity. What we need are followers of Jesus who are willing to advance God's kingdom here on earth. People, people who will build their lives with kingdom work. 
So number two, we're dedicated to kingdom, kingdom work, kingdom of God. God has destined you for kingdom work. Now let's talk about destiny a little bit. Because I know some of you are like, oh, I don't have a destiny. Let's go to the word of God. Ephesians 2.10, for we are his workmanship. You are God's workmanship. And guess what it says? He has a created, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared, now look at this, which God prepared beforehand that we should, that you should walk in them. Your kingdom work was planned in eternity past. This is incredible. In eternity past. See, God prepared beforehand. Before what? Before of all this. Before it all existed. God knew you. He knew you would be born at this time in history. He pre-planned how you could walk in his kingdom agenda. He knew what this world needed. He knew what this world needed and he made you a part of the agenda. God destined you to serve his, his kingdom narrative. He chose you to serve his purposes on planet earth. You are no accident. If you feel like you're an accident today, that is not true. It is a lie from the pit. You were destined to be here right now at this time. He chose you. You are destined by your creator to work for his kingdom. He knew what the world needed and he puts you in it. Oh, come on. Read what it says. In eternity past. Oh, I'm just, you're just what? You're destined to be part of his agenda. Believing in your kingdom destiny is powerful, folks. It's powerful. This acceptance, this belief, it, it, it will change the trajectory of your life. Let me just give you some examples from my own life. So you know, again, some of my story, I've shared it many times over the years. I, I never intended to be a pastor, folks. I, I, I never, this was the farthest, wildest thing. I know some of you look at me and, oh, you probably always knew you wanted to be a pastor. You're probably 12 years old. Oh, want to be a pastor. No! People who know me know that's not true. People who know me are still, every time they see me, you are a walking miracle. Oh my gosh, all right? Never was part of my plan. The concept was way outside my understanding. It was outside of my comfort zone. It was way outside my comfort zone. I was very intimidated by the title, pastor. I didn't feel qualified. I didn't feel worthy. I didn't feel skilled enough. I mean, certainly I'm not spiritual enough. I mean, those guys are like crazy spiritual. That's not me. The first three or four years when I was a youth pastor, I would never let anybody call me pastor. I am a youth director. It so intimidated me. Call me a youth director. Hi, pastor. Director. <laughs> director. Youth director. That, that, that pastor thing was weighty. I just couldn't wear it. So here's one experience. So early on, uh, I was doing, uh, I was teaching on a Sunday morning. We, we changed Sunday morning early on. I just, you know, I was a church kid. I knew t traditional church stuff didn't work. You know, Sunday school. Okay, some of you didn't grow up in church. They had this thing called Sunday school. Kids would go to Sunday school. The teens would go to Sunday school. What kid wants to go to school on Sunday, right? Seriously, I said, well, this has got to change. So we created a youth church and we just rocked the house. We had a band, we moved in the gym. We had 70, 80 kids showing up, okay? And, and so we were in between senior pastors at one time. And so all the kids were in the gym. I'm teaching. I was teaching. I wasn't preaching, okay? Because pastors preach. I just teach. And so I'm teaching the kids and the interim pastor is in the back watching me like this. Now he's got, you know, he wasn't happy or anything. I'm up there, I'm thinking, what a jerk. Anyway, so I'm just, and then it was all done. Kids were dismissed. I'm still in the front. And he just comes marching up to like this. I'm going, oh boy, this is going to be fun. And he gets his finger out like this. I ain't kidding. And he got right in my face and he says, you, young man, are a preacher. And I said, you are crazy. And I walked off. <laughs> He was right, okay? <laughs> but I wasn't there yet. But through a variety of circumstances, learning, other people investing in my life, I finally accepted the truth that, okay, God put a destiny on my life. Once I accepted that, the trajectory, the direction of my life began to change. 
I started living in a way that was more consistent with God's plan for my life. I started serving with a little more boldness, a little more confidence. I decided to go back to school and actually get a master's degree, which I would have never dreamed of doing. Like I said, my self-esteem began to change. This understanding of destiny has kept me in the game all these years. 38 years of ministry. 38 years of ministry. I can't tell you how many times I felt like quitting. But I go back to, Lord, you ordained this to happen. And there are times I still wonder why, but you did. I don't doubt that anymore. And it's like, I can't quit. I can't walk away. Folks, as you begin to accept this marvelous truth, you, you also need to understand that you don't walk in your destiny alone. So here, this next piece is, is exciting. Your kingdom work is a partnership with Jesus. I mean, this is, is such an encouraging verse. Look what it says. 1 Corinthians 1, 9, God will do this and he's faithful to do what he says. Part of this is faithful to do what he says. He, he's destined you for this. He, he's, gonna, he's gonna fulfill this. Now look, and he's invited you into partnership. Wow. With his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Kingdom work is not only for Jesus. It's with Jesus. You and I are in a partnership with Jesus. And that is an amazing truth. Jesus is not like some coach cheering you on from the sideline. Yeah, you go, Dale. You got this. Come on, buddy. Work harder. He's not doing that. He's in the game with you. He's, he's right beside you. He's, he's with you. And this understanding has helped me so much over the years. I mean, listen, I can serve Jesus out of a lot of motivations. I know you can too. They're, they're not always wrong in and of themselves. I've served Jesus out of a sense of duty, out of a sense of obligation, out of a sense of loyalty. Those things are bad, but I can really lose the joy of serving what I feel like I'm serving. I'm just doing this for you, Jesus. And so you're by yourself doing it instead of doing it with him in partnership. Oh, it's all the difference in the world. I'm not up here teaching you by myself. Jesus is up here. You can't see him, but I'm telling you, he's here right next to me. We don't do this by ourselves. I don't do this by myself. Again, when I finally made the connection that this is a partnership, I do kingdom work with and not for, it changed everything. He went from an observer to a teammate. And that's what he'll do with you. He's not asking you to serve him alone. It's just kind of scary, Pastor Dale. I get it. But he's not asking you to do it alone. He's asking you to join him. We see this old time at Foothills. We join Jesus. We follow Jesus. That's what we're invited into. My sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. We are in this together with Jesus. Isn't that cool? Somebody say yes. Okay. <laughs> I've done a lot of serving Jesus by myself. Okay. I'm kind of done with it. I want to do it with him. I also think about all the amazing experiences that I could have missed out on if I wouldn't have followed, if, if I wouldn't have entered this partnership. I think about that all the time. And, and I'm reminded of every time I stand up here, what would I have missed out on? All of this. What would I have missed out on? Seeing God change lives. What would I have missed out on? These incredible relationships. Watching God change a community. Meeting all of you. I mean, on and on and on. The same is true with you. Who knows what God will do? in and through your life. God's destined you for this. He's also designed you for it. He's also designed you for kingdom work. You're a God-designed person for kingdom work. Look, we are, again, going back to workmanship. Now look, here's the word, created in, designed in. Same thing, you're designed in Christ Jesus for good works. So it's important to understand that you are God's workmanship. You're not your workmanship. Just, if you think you're a self-made person, we just get rid of that. That will take you in the wrong direction. If you are just, if you just, you just like that, that is pride, that is arrogance, and that will keep you from following Jesus. I want to be a God-made person. He made me. He designed me. He created me. It's important to understand who I belong to. Understanding your design, though, is absolutely essential. Your unique work is connected to your unique design. God didn't make a mistake designing you. I know sometimes we all have days where we kind of think that. You are perfectly created to fulfill the destiny that God has prepared you for. 
Listen, again, personal story. I personally struggled for years accepting how God made me. I, I, I've walked this journey, you guys. I compared myself to other pastors. So once I accepted destiny, pastor, okay, I'm going to wear that whole pastor thing. What did I start doing? I started looking at other pastors. And I'm going, I'm not like you. I'm not like you. I'm not like you. I'm not like you. Oh, boy. All right? I, I just felt like I didn't have the pastor design. I look at these guys. Lord, they're just, they're so pastoral. Right? And then there's this. What the heck are you doing? I mean, they look like pastors. They just, you know, they got the pastor look, you know? They talk like pastors, act like pastors, spoke like other, I mean, I don't know. See, then again, like you, you look in the mirror and you just think, Lord, um, are you sure? Because this doesn't fit my, the mold out there. And then, and then, of course, you're told certain things. The enemy loves to reinforce the lies in our head, folks. Over the years, I was told so many things. I'm too intense. I'm too passionate. I'm too blunt. I'm too driven. I'm too redneck. Yes, I've been told that. Amen. Really? Too redneck? What's up with that? I'm keeping my guns anyways. Huh? <laughs> Jeez. Too simple? I've been told that. You're just, you're just, I am simple. I don't know if I'm too simple, uh, but I'm simple. Why? Well, it's just, if, if the word of God says it, just do it. So I'm accused of being too simple. Okay. Jesus said, do it. Let's do it. Jesus said, follow me. Okay, let's follow him. That's simple. I, I've been told I'm too idealistic. You're just too idealistic. But isn't that faith? I still believe Jesus changes lives. I actually believe Jesus can change communities. I actually think that's our job to partner with him. I guess if that's too idealistic, yes, I guess I am. I've been told I'm not organized enough. That's true. <laughs> not detailed enough. That's why I put people around me that are gifted differently than me, okay? Huh. Folks, again, it wasn't until I went back to school during uh, where I was working on my master's degree, God ordained a particular professor to be there during that time. I, again, I'm not the type of student who connects with teachers. I just don't do that. I never have done that. And this guy saw me. He actually pursued me. He actually said, Dale, you understand, you understand this thing really in a way that I, I, have, I don't have other students who understand it like you. I want to spend some time with you. I'm like, what are you talking about? He did. He just pursued me. He started pouring into my life. He started talking about your design. He says, Dale, your design's not a mistake. This is how God made you. He made you this way for kingdom purposes. It's not a mistake. You're not supposed to fit whatever this pastoral mode is, okay, or model is. You're supposed to be who God made you to be. And then eventually, after, you know, we, we used to have lunch together uh, at an Elmer's off of 205. And we would have lunch right there. And, and again, then one day he kind of dropped the bomb. He was the first person who sowed this seed in me. He says, Dale, listen, you are wired and designed by God to start a church and I came uh, I just came across the table you're crazy I'll never do that do you see a pattern in my life I just kind of keep saying I'll never do something and then God says yeah, yes you will hmm. folks I'm telling you many of you are no different you look in the mirror and you see everything you're not God sees who you really are he sees your design and he wants to unleash his design in you for his kingdom purposes. Part of that design is that you have a, a gift inside of you that he gave you. Look at your notes there. You're, you're a God-gifted person. And you say, I'm not gifted. Listen to the truth of the word of God again. 1 Corinthians 12, there are different kinds of spiritual gifts. The same spirit is the source of them all. There are different kinds of service, but, he, but we serve the same Lord. God works in different ways, but it is the same God who does the work in all of us. Here it is, come on. A spiritual gift is given to each of us so that we can help each other. A spiritual gift is put inside of you. You have a spiritual gift inside of you for one purpose only. It is to serve the purposes of God. It was given to you for kingdom work. Unless you employ and use that gift, it will lay dormant in your life forever. 
A spiritual gift is not a natural talent like singing, artistic ability, athletic ability. I mean, some things are hardwired into us from birth. A spiritual gift is something that you get the moment you say yes to Jesus. When, when you turn your life over to him, a spiritual gift is put inside of you and it pairs with everything else that you're designed with. It pairs with your natural abilities, your, your things you've learned, your experiences, okay? But it is an ability given to you for the purposes of God. And it's inside of you. It's an ability of your kingdom work. It's part of your design. God puts something special inside of you. You're thinking, there's nothing special inside of me. It's not true. It's not true. Oh, so much of this stuff that goes on inside of us and this internal conflict, you know, the stress, the anxiety, the, the insecurities, it is because we, we just, do, we believe the lies in our head more than we believe the truth of the word of God. And we're paralyzed because of it. Seeing ourselves accurately makes all the difference. All the difference. Some of you struggle with being involved because you struggle believing that you are destined and you are designed. But I'm asking you to trust him. I'm asking you this morning to trust what God says instead of the lies in your head today. Because I'm going to ask you to take one more step. Here you go. Decide to be equipped for kingdom work. Don't just sit here and agree. Now it's time to do something. This whole series has been insanely practical. And we're not going to stop now. Ephesians 4 says their responsibility. Who's the there in that passage? Are spiritual leaders in the church. So my responsibility. Pastor's responsibility. This is part of my job description. So if you want to know why I get passionate about this. Well I have a job description. I'm trying to do my job is to equip God's people to do his work. There it is. That's part of my job description. My job is to get you engaged. My job is to get you unleashed. My, God, my job is to get you in the game. Come on, let's do this. So I'm trying to do my job this morning. All right? So help me out a little bit. I'm a, if I had a job review, or a, you know, I have to, I'm going to be accountable for this. So, uh, and build up the church, the body of Christ. Okay, so again, my job description. So what I'm asking you to do this morning, a couple things as we wrap this up. I'm going to ask you to pursue your design. The design that God has for you. Folks, there's no equipping if you don't understand how God designed you to partner with him in kingdom work. Understanding how God uniquely created you. Serving, it, 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 that's, what, that's part of moving forward spiritually. Last week we talked about I mean, spiritual growth. This is part of spiritual growth. Understanding how God made you, designed you, getting involved in that. This is what spiritual growth just it looks like. It's more than taking classes. It's more than listening to the pastor. As much as I want you to listen to me, I want you to do it. We can do it together. So, okay, what's the TV for? Well, they wheeled it out here. And pretty soon you weren't looking at me. You're looking at the TV. So let's, let's turn this thing on. So what I'm going to ask you to do is I want you to go to our website. Now, before you, you go here, you can, there's a QR code that's up on the screen. And if you hold your phone up there, it'll just take you right to our volunteer page. Here's something funny I got to tell you. We're constantly learning. Okay, so in the first service, I asked everybody to do this. And we printed the QR code on your notes. And then after the service, we found out it didn't work. I said, well, of course it worked. We, we tested it. We, it, it. we got this notification that we exceeded our QR code limit. Who knew there was such a thing? Okay, what the heck? So we had to update that thing and scramble in the moment. Like I said, we're always learning. So the one on the notes will not work. The one on the screen will. And then the one at the back tables. So that's the one you use, not the one on your notes because... We're learning. So there you go. So if you go to our volunteer page, this is what it'll look like. Some of you have never been to our website, never seen our volunteer page. Would you please go there? So I know you can go there right now in the service, but right now you don't want to because you're listening to me. Please go there this afternoon. Please check it out. I want to see our visits on our website go through the roof. Here's where you're going to see three things. Practical things you all can do. First thing, it says click here to launch a spiritual gift assessment. Some of you don't even know what a spiritual gift is. This is a great place to start. Just start exploring. Go take the assessment. You, this doesn't go to anybody. It's just for you. You know, no one's going to contact you, try to sell you anything. It's, it's just you, okay? Do some learning. Next thing here, click here 
okay, to view a list of spiritual gifts and ministries because we want to pair spiritual gifts up with ministries and programs we have in the church because that's how it's going to be the most fun because you're serving in a way that you're designed and you're gifted. Here's this last one says, click here to submit. Oh, look at that. Who's doing that? That was cool. Click here to submit your interest in volunteering. Somebody will contact you in 48 hours. 48 hours. It's a big deal. If you don't get contacted in 48 hours, I want a phone call. Because someone's going to get in trouble. <laughs> Just saying. 48 hours. You better check your email or answer your phone because you don't want to get them in trouble. 48 hours. We're going to get back with you. Okay, click here. This is the only time someone's going to contact you. So you can be anonymous, grow, learn, all by yourself. This is when someone's going to get back with you. So please... Some of you I know are like, well, I don't like that whole technology thing, Pastor Dale. Not a problem. There's people sitting out there in the hallway waiting for you. Please go talk to them. They will walk you through it. They will pull up the website. You could take the assessment right there. I think they probably even have one printed for you. You could actually use a pencil, okay? However you want to do it. We want to remove as many barriers as possible so that you move in this direction. And we do this together. So please. Let's do this together. So I'm going to wrap up here. Last thing. I'm going to encourage you to give expression now to that design. We have to get involved. You got to get plugged in. Our design needs expression. Your design needs expression. Folks, I said this before, without doing this, there will be pieces and parts of your life that will lay dormant in your life forever. You don't want to get to heaven someday and then see Jesus. And he says, I put all this in you. I put all this in you. What do you mean? You didn't put anything in me. You never gave me a chance to show you. Men and women, please stop believing you know yourself better than your creator. He designed you, not you. And it is arrogant of us to say, God, I know who I am. I'm fully aware of who I am. Last time I checked, he made you, not you. And the only way for you to discover what's inside of you is to walk this course, it is to embrace what he's called us into. I am still discovering what God has put inside of me after 38 years of ministry. So my guess is you have some more to discover too. Let's do this together. I want to finish just with the words of Jesus. Jesus said, the harvest is great. The workers are few. Folks, I think it's easy for us to you come to a church like this and it seems large and it's successful and it's like, oh, they don't have any place for me. They don't have any place for me to serve. That's entirely not true. Entirely not true. We live in one of the most unchurched places in the United States. That's just facts. One of the most unchurched places in the United States. This church exists. You know what the purpose of this church is? This purpose, the purpose of this church is to reach thousands of unchurched people. Okay? We've, been, we've said that from, from day one. Thousands. Why would you say thousands? Because there's thousands of unchurched people who don't know Jesus, all right? So we're going after them because we're called to do that. Reach thousands of unchurched people. Reach, equip people to follow Jesus. We're not giving people just content. We want followers because Jesus said, follow me. So we equip people in this church to follow Jesus. And the third word is transform. We transform our communities. Reach, equip, transform. That's what this church is all about. In order to do that, we need an army of people. How many more people, Pastor? Just tell me, how many more volunteers do we need? How many more people do we need serving? You want, you want the truthful answer? Hundreds. Hundreds. Will I be thrilled if 20 people want to get involved? Absolutely. What do we need? Maybe about another 200. Why? Be, because we have big things we want to do. But we're, we're hindered. Just like Jesus said, man, the harvest is huge, but we're We're hindered. Is that my phone? Oh, sorry. Phone was ringing. You've heard me talk about wanting to start a third service. Well, we want to start a Saturday service. Why don't we do it? Because we don't have the volunteers. It takes 70 people at least to run, to run one service. We want to expand the resource center. If, let me just say, everything that we do, we want to expand it. And that doesn't even get into the new stuff we want to do. How many people we need? Hundreds. Let's do this. Let's do this. What I'm praying for is that I'm praying, Lord, let us be the answer to that prayer. The fields, they're ripe for harvest, but there's a labor shortage. And so, Lord, may we, may Foothills be the answer to that prayer in our geographic area. Let's 
do this. I know some of you are afraid. I know it requires us to change our lives. But folks, I'm telling you, that's what following Jesus is all about. And the world needs, and the world needs Jesus. We can sit here and complain about the world or we can change it. Amen? Amen. That's what we're called to do. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you that you've called us to partner with you. That's incredible. Partner with you. So Lord, I pray we say yes. I pray we take the journey. I I pray we go to the website. I pray we get involved. I, I, I pray you show us how our lives need to change so that we can follow you. May we not miss out, Lord, on the greatest adventure of our life. It's not doing our own thing. It's doing your thing. I pray that this church would be the answer to that prayer. In our geographic area, Lord, okay, Lord, we're going to go. If the laborers are few, we're going to roll up our sleeves and go to work. Now show us how to follow you into our community. So, Lord, thank you. Thank you for not giving up on us, Lord. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen, we always, we always have people here to pray with you. So before we leave, listen, there's always people off to my left, people in the back corner. Some of you are hurting so bad, you can't even imagine trying to serve right now. Nor should you. It's okay. You need people to pray with you. You need people to love you. So during this last song, if you, just, you need that today, go find one of these people in one of those places. And let us just love you where you're at today. And for the rest of us, let's get in the game. If you're already serving, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. But if you're already serving, let me say this. Find one other person. Go influence one other person. And, and I was going to say drag them, but you know what I mean. Lovingly. Come on. Come on. Be a part of what God's doing. Go influence someone else. I mean, we can only do so much. You have more influence than I do. Now go influence someone. And let's go to work for the king. Lord bless you.